Hi. Well, I'm guessing if you're watching this video that you've played the game of Risk. Let me let me just be clear. You did play the game of Risk, right? Hey, if you didn't play, please stop the recording. Go play the game. You really must do it to, to do well in the assessment. And uh, in this module, I'm trying to teach something that will help in the, in the real world. So please go play the game. It will be, it'll be really helpful for you in the assessment and be really helpful for you in real life. Okay. So if you're still watching this video, I have to assume that you played the game. How did you do? Did you lose? Did you win? If you won, did you win nicely? If you lost, how did you feel? Well, let me tell you how I felt. But before I tell you how I felt, I need to explain. I would have been about 14 when I first played the game of Risk. And uh, I would have played it with my father. And I would have played it at the same time with uh, many of my uh, friends from... Uh, from school so uh, I would have wanted to have done well I'd have cared about winning the game I'd have cared about making a good impression on my friends hey I may even have cared about making an impression on my father though I perhaps wouldn't have known that at the time but I'm, I'm sure that that definitely is true okay so having explained that I was about uh, 14 when I first played this game and uh, I lost my my first game and many more after that um, I'll tell you how I uh, I felt well I felt really egotistical I felt that I was smarter than most of the people playing that game at that particular time in my, my father's house and um, I should win by divine right and um, I thought there was something wrong with the game well I didn't perhaps think there was something wrong with the game but uh, yeah no I did actually I thought there was something wrong with the game that I wasn't winning because I was that good now in reality I wasn't that good and one great thing about games I mean, and a game of risk can take four to five hours to complete, certainly when you first try it. One of the great things about games is that they give you very fast feedback, much faster than uh, real life. And uh, I won the, I lost the game of risk because I um, didn't deserve to win. I didn't have the necessary talents, which includes being in control of my, uh, my ego, if I'm absolutely honest. And looking back, I really shouldn't have expected to win. My father had been playing the game for years. Um, there was absolutely no reason to think that I'd be better than my friends who hadn't played. Um, chances are I would be you know, about average compared to my peers who hadn't played the game before, never having played it before myself. So that was entirely um, unrealistic. And um, as for the ego thing, well, you know, that does mirror itself somewhat in real life. Let me, let me show you what I mean by way of an example. And that example is in the book that accompanies this course. Um, we all know, I know I, nobody has to be an expert in World War II um, to follow the point I'm about to make or to do well in the module, that won't come up uh, not, not directly anyway um, and I'm not giving anything away there I've just, as far as I know, it's, and I haven't written the assessment yet it's going to be in the, that part of the assessment now then uh, so 1956 obviously that's after the Second World War but uh, during the course of the Second World War uh, Britain and France um, or well, certainly towards the end of it, had become far weaker than they were before the uh, the Second World War. For the Brits, and me being a Brit in particular, I can say this, uh, though I wasn't born, um, it was my grandfather's time. Um, my mother was born in 46, my dad 35, so well, well before my time. Anyway, up until that point, and in re recent history at that time, Britain had gotten used to having an empire and all of the things that go with that, thinking that the Brits are superior and so on, all that, that nonsense. And um, we'd lost empire. Um, and at the end of the Second World War, we were heavily in debt to uh, the US, heavily in debt. Basically, we were financed by the US. France too. France had had empire. France had lost empire. Um, but, you know, with our allies, we'd won the Second World War so on so forth um, 1956 so moving on to 1956 there was the event of the Suez um, the Suez Canal and the French and the Brits um, got together colluded to bring about an event uh, and they didn't involve America they didn't even think to involve America and um, basically the Brits and their French got the got their backsides handed to them by uh, by the Americans all I can say is that uh, power had moved on 
Britain and France weren't the world powers that they used to be and that they tried to collude to bring about an event that they hadn't um, collaborated with the US about and it just didn't work. Said differently, comparing it to the game of Risk at that point, the US was a stronger player and it doesn't matter how much you think you're good uh, based on history, based on long-standing history, doesn't matter how many military campaigns you think you've won and therefore you're the better player. It's all about who's the stronger player at that particular time at that particular game. And in that particular time, America was the stronger player and the way the British and the French handled the Suez Canal incident in 1956 is a powerful lesson to us all. Never ignore where power really is and keep your ego intact. And um, you know, I would say that that event really did shape both British and French uh, foreign policy towards the US um, up, right up until the present day. Now Britain and France have gone in very different directions um, as regards the US um, but it was all I would say based on what happened from 1956 and the French and the British learning that lesson. The Brits decided to um, collaborate with the US um, and I always have ever since since then and some would argue before and some would say rightly so because America got us out of two world wars but the killer point here the germane point is that no matter how good you think you are no matter how much history proves that you're good um, sometimes people are just more powerful than, than, than you and uh, you have to recognize where power is and manage yourself and how you play the game of life accordingly Bill Gates has said paraphrasing here but success is a, is a very poor teacher. It convinces otherwise very intelligent people that they can't fail. And the reality is, the reality is talented and intelligent people can fail. And uh, the game of risk teaches us all that. Hey, if you failed because your strategy was poor and you've learned something from that, fantastic. Let's see how you do it in the second game. Um, and one other thing, if you won, did you win gracefully? This is really going to matter because if you won, the people you played with uh, they're going to remember that you won. If you're playing with them again in the second round, um, it may or may not be that they'll gang up against you. Um, but one would hope that they gang up against you because you're the stronger player, and that's a tactic that they've developed. If so, so be it. Rather than that they've ganged up against you because you, uh, you celebrated a little bit too much and too openly your victory with your peers and make them feel small. And that's one killer thing here. Let's say you're negotiating. It's, it, you can be a hard-nosed negotiator if the result that you want is only for that particular negotiation. But if you're stuck with that particular group for a longer period of time, you'd have to moderate your negotiating style such that if you won your first, let's say one, I mean, uh, one as opposed to lost at least, won your first negotiation um, with that particular group, um, but you're particularly hard and obnoxious to deal with, they may not want to deal with you again. Um, and there, there are really like three types of style when it comes to negotiating, and I would argue winning risk, and I would argue to dealing with change and regulation in real life. So the first approach is, and I've certainly been guilty of this myself, is the evaluative approach. And that means that you evaluate everyone's ideas, um, you're dispassionate in your evalua evaluation, laser-like, uh, in your analysis, you spare nobody's feelings and you weigh your expertise heavily, which is to say that if, if you know that somebody else's idea is rubbish, you'll be quick to tell them so and tell them precisely why and make them feel small. Hey, that's no issue. That's what you would call a evaluative style. The evaluation may well be right um, and it's a particular style, but it's a particular style, a particular style that probably only works for you in the short term. The next type of approach is the facilitative approach or the collaborative approach so facilitative approach slash collaborative approach they're the same thing um, and that's where you don't evaluate at all you facilitate you see that there are different opinions in the room and you try to get those opinions out you might brainstorm and you might set up rules like there's no such you mustn't rubbish um, ideas from in the first instance when they're brainstormed but once everyone's got their ideas out then we can start to be evaluative but you wouldn't evaluate necessarily it would be a team evaluation nobody would feel that you'd brought your evaluations directly to the process 
That's a facilitative stroke evaluative approach. Another approach, and this is way, I would, yeah, so here's the personal opinion. Um, I would say that this approach I'm about to tell you about is a much better approach for longer term change where the, the, this kind of negotiation process will be iterative and you've got to work with these people and build relationships over the long term. The, the, this is transformative. This is where, you're, where you adopt a collaborative approach so well that people look forward to dealing with you in future. So, so using the transformative approach where there's an extra set of differences, where there's an extra set of negotiations, people are almost glad that, that, that this has happened, that this potential dispute has happened because they know you're going to, you're going to be collaborative and they enjoy that process. And uh, what can I say? Risk is, is much the same. You can be evaluative, you can be combative uh, in one game of risk. But if you're going to play many games of risk, you'll find that you want to uh, upgrade your approach to at least being collaborative. And if you want to start winning um, later on games of risk, and hey, have people trust you off, away from the game of risk, then uh, a transformative approach I would argue is the better one. Hey, if you see it differently, that's that's fine. I look forward to hearing your ideas. But uh, I can tell you, I'm an accountant by core competence. I've certainly been evaluative and uh, it works fine in accountancy. But when you're trying to manage wider programs uh, with a much, group, a much much broader group of stakeholders, where you're trying to um, manage people who don't work for you, uh, it's not evaluative approach wouldn't work in uh, in that type of scenario you'd have to be far more collaborative or hopefully transformative again this wouldn't isn't, isn't part of the assessment this part that i'm about to speak about um, but people have different styles and you can look at it as sort of discs discs uh, discs so um, driven ideas um, um, the S, I think, is for almost like shy, but it's not quite shy, and the C is, is conservative. Then you've got things like Myers-Briggs. doesn't matter. The key point here is that you have to tailor your approach to pe different people's personality, and it may be that some people really like an evaluative approach, but they only like an evaluative approach behind a closed door where it's one-on-one. -on -one. There may be some people who absolutely loathe and despise an evaluative approach and much prefer you to be more of a consummate politician. Hey, you've got to bait the hook to suit the fish and analyze the scenario. Um, but in general, I would say we have to evolve beyond the evaluative approach and aspire to the transformative. And you'll certainly see that in the game of risk and who wants to play with you next and how they play with you. Um, and it's never a good idea to upset people so much in the game of risk that it, it, uh, <laughs> that it builds up some dislike. Um, beyond a particular game or a particular instance of, a partic of the game of risk. So uh, hopefully you manage not to do that. It's a good idea to have a journal for this particular module, hey, maybe for others, but certainly it's going to be useful to you to know what you thought before you played the game of risk, uh, what you learned from it, what you thought you'd learned from it, what you did learn from it, what the delta was between all of those things. Really, it's all about contrast. And it's very useful to actually write how you felt uh, in, in yourself, how you felt about the game, uh, what's and all, how you felt about your opponents, whether you thought the game was uh, realistic, you know, really carte blanche, whatever you like. And uh, like all journals, it's for you, it's not for me. I, I, I won't ever ask to look at it. Um, but you may choose to draw on it later in this module. Uh, you probably will. And it'd be very useful for you to have that contrast so that you can see how your, how, your, how your opinions have changed during the course of this module. And I guarantee you they'll have changed somewhat. Another thing I found when I was playing the game of Risk was that I had a strategy before I started playing the game and the way the game unfolded uh, just didn't allow me to pursue that strategy effectively. Hey, it was a long time ago and I can't remember particularly what that strategy was or even whether it was any good. Um, and I dare say that this has happened to you as well in, in your first game of Risk assuming that this has been your very first game of risk. It may be that when you planned your, your play and when you're trying to play your plan, events just unfolded in such a way that um, you couldn't do that. Okay. Now, some will say, some might say, that, that maybe that you 
um, hadn't planned enough. Some will say um, that you hadn't built in contingency. Some will say um, that, hey, you do go in there with a plan, um, but you have to, what you might call, you have to flex your plan to the situation, situational leadership, if you like. Hey, in the end, where you stand on this belongs to you and not to me. Um, but certainly I found that I couldn't execute the strategy that I wanted to because of the way the game was unfolding. And um, I'm going to use a sporting analogy here because that's kind of the theme of this module. It's much the same if you're playing a game of golf. Now, I'm British. In the UK, golf isn't quite so elitist as I perceive it can be sometimes in the US. So in the US, my perception of golf is that it's way more expensive um, and way more um, tilted towards the male rather than the female, where in the UK, it's much cheaper to play golf um, and it certainly isn't. Um, and yeah, it's, it's predominant. It's it, it's played by men predominantly, but many women play it. My wife plays it. My daughter plays it, and my wife plays it better than I do. So uh, let me just make that clear. So when I'm talking about golf, I'm, this is in no way a sexist thing. I think sport mirrors real life, and what we can we can learn from that. It's really valuable, be it male, female, young, old, black, white, or whatever. Now then, having explained that, let's just say that my favourite club is uh, a, a driver. A, a, um, so we'd call that um, a one wood, um, sometimes in the UK, or you might call it a one metal. It doesn't matter, but it's the most, um, it's the heaviest club that can, get, that can go the longest distance. Um, but that, of course, depends on your ability to hit it, to hit it powerfully and accurately. Now then, Let's just say that my most, my favourite club is the one wood slash the driver. Um, now, the shot I've just played, I've played into a bunker, and it's plugged in that bunker. Now, I may have an excellent swing. I may have been have tutored, I've had that swing tutored. I may have spent thousands of dollars developing that swing, and that driver of mine in in the uh, in the trolley may be in the in my bag. Uh, maybe my most fantastic club, uh, maybe a club that I play whenever I can, it's a club I really expensive and I have a large amount of ego attached to it. However, I've just played a shot into the sand pit. It's in a bunker and it's plugged. Key point here is you can't always play your best club and you can't always play with a perfect swing. So if it's plugged, I'm going to have to adopt my swing, I'm going to have to adopt, adjust my stance. I'm going to have to choose whether I'm going from the left to the right. I'm going to have to uh, probably take the grip further down the shaft than I otherwise would. And you know what? I may have to lay up. The key thing is here, when you're in a bad situation, you have to accept sometimes that you're in a bad situation. Lay up, take the pain, move on. And most importantly, when you're in your next shot, have cleared your mind from the previous bad shot that you played. One thing that golf's really good at is teaching us that when you make a mistake, learn from it, clear your mind, move on. Many other games don't do that. So one thing I would say to you is that you're gonna have made mistakes in a game of risk. If you won, you may not have been, been particularly courteous about that. If you lost, you may feel that you didn't play well, or it may be for other reasons. Who knows? Maybe everything was against you. Sometimes it is the territory. Um, but key point being, you have whatever you whatever you got wrong, whatever you got right, clear your mind. Now play your next shot. Okay, so I'm recording this on the 9th of September, 2016. And uh, to put that in context, that's two days after um, the Apple special event when they launched the iPhone 7. Now you might say, Goodness me, Hayden, it's a strange thing that amongst all the things that are happening everywhere in the world, you choose to put a date in context by what's happening with Apple. Uh, but let's not forget, by market capitalization, Apple is the largest company in the world at the moment. And um, so for that reason, I'm going to use that to justify uh, this particular, particular contextualization, be it tenuous or not. Now, Apple, um, they've um, following their conference, they, they've just launched some wireless headphones. And I should explain that this recording is being done on a 
iPhone 6 Plus. It's being done on a mic that, whilst it isn't Apple, it's endorsed by Apple. And the reason it's not being done by Apple, the, the microphone recording, is because their microphone isn't quite good enough for what we're trying to do here. Um, also, when I finish this, I will um, take this recording. I'll edit it somewhat in Final Cut Pro on my Mac, and Final Cut Pro being another piece of Apple software. I own two Macs, two iPods, sorry, I own two Macs, an iPod, two iPads, an iPhone, several iPhones of various different models, uh, an Apple Watch. Um, so I have to say, oh, and a, yeah, an Apple Watch. Uh, so however you look at it, I'm definitely an Apple fan. Um, but I want to explain risk um, in the context of Apple. Now, it's interesting. In the mid-90s, Apple nearly went bankrupt. And this is well known and it's publicly available. Um, and really, the, the, the rationale, what's germane about what I'm about to explain to you is that um, sometimes you have to manage risk depending on how big you are. Uh, and it has to vary depending on how big you are and the kind of problems that you have. So in the 1990s, I think it was the uh, mid-1990s, Apple nearly went bankrupt. So they had a particular set of financial problems to deal with, um, stakeholder problems to deal with. Now, of course, as we all know, they make wonderful products that most of us are fans of. And now they have, the, and they're the biggest company by market capitalization. And now they have different financial problems to deal with. And here's what I mean. So within the last couple of weeks, the EU made a ruling against Apple. Well, more against the Irish government, actually, not against Apple, that Apple owed um, 13, uh, 13 billion euros, 11 billion US um, to the Irish tax authorities. Uh, and it was because the Irish had um, set up structures for Apple, et al, that the EU Commission didn't agree with. And they thought that that amounted to um, undue state aid. Now, whether you agree with it or not, isn't really the issue that I'm trying to uh, discuss here. Um, but why Apple? Well, Apple weren't the first, actually, that were gone after in this context. You could argue that it was Google before that in, uh, in the UK. Why Apple? Because they're the biggest. Why at this particular time? Well, there's a, a lot of focus at the moment on tax schemes. And um, also, we're in a situation now where there's, and forgive me, you're, much of this audience will know way more about US politics than I can ever aspire to know about US politics. Uh, but I do have this perception that people stand up to uh, American politicians, American institutions, far more towards the end of the second term of a presidential of a presidential term than they ever would say when a new president is an, is uh, installed. So I do think part of it's to do with that. But there is a climate at the moment of clamping down on perceived uh, tax evasion, overt uh, tax avoidance, um, and Apple are just the biggest. And because they're the biggest, they can't. I'm going to use the phrase get away with, but that don't, please don't um, think that I'm being pejorative in that sense. They may or may not have gotten away with anything. And in any event, it was inside the law. Um, but why Apple? Well, because they're the biggest and because everyone's, everyone's heard of them. You know, one can try to make an example, rightly or wrongly, on a small company, but it won't be so newsworthy. It won't be so politically, it wouldn't get the kind of political scrutiny that Apple will get. And so one can argue that perhaps Apple should have seen this coming because now that they're the biggest company in the world, that they're going to have the biggest company in the world's financial problems and reputational risks to manage. And the, you, the extent to which you have to manage your reputation, I would argue, is enhanced uh, the bigger that you become. I would say that Apple should you know, really should have seen this um, this coming from the EU um, and having like 100 billion US uh, away in uh, Bermuda is what can I say that's that can never be invisible money um, and hey I just think that Apple should should start to manage its risk in line with the fact that it's the uh, biggest company in the world and that means rightly or wrongly it's a target and uh, rightly or wrongly, therefore, it has a target painted on its back. And uh, when you have a target painted on your back, don't be surprised if people aim at you. 
So there you go. What I'm really saying is that risk management changes depending on the size that you are. And if you're a company that's grown very, very quickly, and I would argue that Apple have grown very, very quickly. I mean, they were big before the 90s and they were almost in uh, into receivership. Now they're the biggest company in the world. That means they have to tailor their risk management strategies appropriately. Another thing I would say about Apple is that um, the, the iPhone 7 makes a lot of play about photos. And uh, you know what, photos are great. This is being recorded. Uh, a video, not a photo, I, I, I admit, but this is being recorded uh, entirely through Apple products. But they haven't paid the same attention to sound, I would argue. And let me explain why I would argue that. And also, let me say, these opinions are just my own. They're the opinions of Hayden Perryman, they're not the opinions of Texas A&M Law School. But they haven't paid attention to sound. I've heard it said by the American press that uh, Apple headphones are uh, are regarded as a status symbol. The, the previous, the um, current Apple headphones, not the wireless ones that are coming in. Um, maybe it's my age, uh, but I'm not as old as perhaps you might think. Um, but to me, Apple headphones are cheap headphones. They um, they're not a status symbol, and really, what they reveal is that you're. Hey, these are my opinions. Tone deaf. Um, you can't get great quality sound from Apple headphones. And hey, I can hear you saying, well, hang on a minute, they bought Dre, they bought um, they bought, draw, bought uh, Beats. And this again might surprise you <laughs> that I'm younger than you perhaps think I am. But um, I have no problem with Dre. Um, I've been a big follower of his um, since, um, well, even before he was in, in NWA. So he was in something called the World Class Wrecking Crew uh, before that. And one of, my, one of my first US imports that I bought was uh, Juice by the World Class Wrecking Crew. But we are going back there to Crumbs about 1985. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of Dre, NWA, his work. But his headphones, in my opinion, they're not as good as they're marketed to be. True audiophiles would, wouldn't listen to Apple headphones. They would consider the Dre headphones better than uh, the Apple headphones, but they'd consider that, I would argue, a low bar. True audiophiles wouldn't listen to uh, to uh, Beats headphones, and uh, Apple makes a great play of how it's dedicated to sound and how sound and music is a core part of its business. Yet, the headphones it produces don't are not faithful to what was recorded in musical studios. Uh, they've just removed the headphone jack, and. Um, you know, you can't argue that that's to do with musical quality issues because you can get great sound from a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Um, and uh, even now, the best audio quality is delivered via wired technology, not wireless technology. Wireless technology still has a long way to go. Hey, it is improving and some great audio companies are working with lightning, ca lightning cable uh, headphones and wireless uh, technology, but they're not there yet, not for the true audiophile. Also, if you're a musical artist, when you, you've, you've, you've probably, you, well, if you're a musical, musical artist, you'll definitely have seen this. Apple have got this um, type of um, structure where they say mastered for iTunes. Now, what does mastered for iTunes actually mean? Well, it's a response to a um, an assertion made by Neil Diamond that uh, music wasn't being recorded. Sorry, not that music wasn't being recorded, but music wasn't being delivered to customers via the iTunes store in anything like the quality that it was made in of, of how it was made in the studios. Now, there are counter arguments to this, and yes, it's a fact that if you take the iTunes format of music, which is 256 uh, mega kilobits per second uh, AAC. Uh, that, that is not an approximation to how it's typically recorded. Um, now, and also there's, you have to compress music to get it even into CD format, but the AAC format that uh, Apple uses is compressed even more. And if you take a compressed format, which is the CD, and compress it even further into Apple AAC, Apple would argue, well, that's a two-step process. It can't be as effective as a one-step process. 
i.e. let's eliminate the, the compressed CD. All CDs are compressed, they call that red book. Um, fine. So what does Apple do? Well, Apple says, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to be under our Masters for iTunes umbrella, then you have to submit to us a 24-bit, uh, 96 kilobits, uh, uh, yeah, kilobits, WAV file. Now, hey, not everybody's into this kind of stuff. I fully appreciate that. But that's a very, very big file, vastly superior to anything customers can download from iTunes uh, for, for the music. And so what's happening is Apple are getting really high resolution, high quality masters of music, and they're churning out rubbish to the customers. At the same time, they've cut the uh, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. At the same time, they're encouraging uh, customers to move to wireless technology. So now you're moving to wireless technology on a lossy format. That's nothing like the quality that artists have um, actually submitted directly to Apple. To top it all off, these, um, these wireless headphones, they go in your ear. They're, I think, $139 or $159. I don't know which, so forgive me if I got that bit wrong. But they're by any definition, relatively expensive, whether they're expensive for the technology they have and they're wireless, hey, that's, that definitely is an argument. But they go in your ear, they're, they're, they're small, and they cost about, as I say, $159, maybe it's $139. Only thing is here that, so the, the audio quality, no matter how you look at it, is relatively poor for a company that says music is the center of its, its, its corporate culture. And also, these headphones are tiny, with no wires, can easily get lost. Now, maybe in Cupertino, if that's how you pronounce it, but maybe in Cupertino or San Francisco or wherever, um, you can wear these kinds of things without getting mugged uh, because, everywhere, because people are just so wealthy everywhere you go. But in the majority of places, if you're going to wear something which does amount to a status symbol that's so small, you're going to get mugged. I mean, this is an accident waiting to happen. Um, so I'm beginning to see that, I, I, yeah, so I personally think Apple's making a mistake in the, in the, in the audio space. It's not staying faithful to uh, what it says is its roots, to, be, to, more, to music being part of its corporate culture. It's put photography way ahead of music. And I don't have a problem with photography being important. Of course it is, but music at least as important, I would argue. Um, and they've, to my mind, abandoned quality. They've put uh, convenience ahead of fidelity in terms of music. And the funny thing is that if you look at how an iPhone is configured, um, the chips that they have, they can produce excellent sound quality. And ironically, you can get the best sound quality out of a phone, not by using 3.5 millimeter, but by using lightning and so on and so forth. So. I would accept that, uh, but the way that, so App, Apple have a product that could give absolutely fantastic quality sound um, with very little alteration, and I know that myself because I do a few few things to alter the iPhone, uh, well, in terms of the accessories that I use on top of the iPhone to get tremendous audio file sound. I won't bore you with what those things are, but I will tell you that Apple has the ability, the inbuilt technology to deliver fantastic sound and it just doesn't do that. Now, where am I going with all this then? Well, I would say that after Steve Jobs, they've lost their way. And you know, Steve Jobs had a real, um, a, a real kind of overall direction for the theme of Apple and where it was going. We're seeing Apple now starting to, to um, uh, use styluses. Steve Jobs uh, wouldn't have done that. Now, um, okay, Tim Cook has been was told by Steve Jobs never ask what I would do but it's a material departure. The fact that they've got the technology to produce superior sound and haven't, I would argue is a mistake. The fact that they um, are gonna have these tiny wireless headphones that are easy to lose, um, at, uh, I would argue is a mistake. The fact that you can get mugged by wearing these things, I would argue is a mistake. And I think that the damage is going, the, the, I think the reputation is going to be damaged as people find um, in the near future that they're getting mugged for these headphones, that they're losing these headphones. To top it all off, 
Apple described the uh, elimination of the 3.5 millimeter headphone socket in the iPhone 7 as the ex the as courageous. They said that they had exercised courage. Um, I don't think that was the best use of words. I think that that they're going to be the laughing stock because hey, the word courage that explains the pursuit of noble things, not the elimination of a 3.5 millimeter headphone socket. So I think when you look at uh, Apple's exposure to tax matters, uh, regardless of where you stand on whether those tax matters are genuine, should have happened or shouldn't have happened, I think Apple needs to manage its reputation very carefully. I think the 100 billion US dollars in Bermuda, Apple need to think very carefully about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, about how they manage that risk, whether they ought to start repatriating some of that money back to the US, um, corporation tax percentages notwithstanding. I think that the fact that these uh, wireless headphones are going to get lost um, is going to be con a continue continuous bane to Apple and their reputation. I think that people might get mugged for these wireless headphones. Again, won't do anything for, the, for Apple's reputation. The thing is about these products is that when you rely on them, you, you know, also when you use them and they just work, as Apple have often said, it just works, you absolutely love them. But the minute you start to question them, then your loyalty can fast disappear. And I know this myself because I had some problems with the iPhone 6, uh, 6 Plus, the one I'm recording on now. And I had to have it repaired a couple of times. The, the point I'm making here is that the minute I started to lose confidence in it, I actually started to lose confidence in the entire brand. And for me personally, I then thought, well, I'm only gonna stay with them if they really address uh, the, the sound issues because I know that Apple have the, uh, the masters to produce great music. I know that they have the technology to deliver that great music to the, um, to the end user, to the customer. And I know that because with just a few accessories on top of an, I of an iPhone, you can get all true audiophile sound. And they haven't done that. And I decided that um, two key things were important to me music quality and uh, Evernote. So if, and I'll explain what I mean in just a moment. So once Apple had alienated me with, prob with the problems that I had with the iPhone 6 Plus, which you wouldn't have expected, and it's not, it's not germane what those problems were, um, then you start to evaluate your whole um, customer loyalty. And I decided that two killer things were important to me. What those two things were isn't your main, but it may be the same. The two things may not be the same for you as they are for me, but you'll have things which are really important to you. One for me is sound, the other for me is note taking in the form of Evernote. And I was waiting for the iPhone 7 and I was saying to myself, if they did something about um, um, high resolution music, uh, then I almost certainly would stay with Apple. Or, uh, if they did something that made them unique in the way that they handle Evernote, that was superior to the way other companies handle Evernote, that would be compelling. Of course, if they did both, it would be a no-brainer for me. But if they did either, that would be compelling. But they did neither. So now my personal devotion to Apple is not what it was.